Okay, so good evening everyone and welcome to Princeton Public Library. I'm Jeannie Herman. I see so many familiar faces here, but for those I have yet to meet, I am the manager of adult programming. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the library's community room this evening for the annual Phyllis Marchand Leadership Lecture. Um, it's an author event for the recently released book, Over the Influence, Why Social Media is Toxic for Women and Girls and How We Can Take It Back. It's a very important topic written by Kara Alimo. And Kara is joined tonight in conversation with Jean Greenway Carr, and they'll be examining how social media affects women of all ages. Two quick housekeeping notes. Please note the room is equipped with a hearing loop that pairs with key coil technology if you require hearing assistance. We do have headphones available for your convenience, and we're gonna ask during the Q&A that everybody speak into a microphone for this reason. And we kindly ask that you silence your electronic devices. If you haven't yet done so, please take a moment to do that. Uh, we have our partners, Labyrinth, here, selling books for us, and uh, there will be a book signing after the event. In addition, if you are a high school or university student, uh, thanks to the Leadership Lecture Fund, we do have books available to give out to students free of charge. Uh, so if you're here and you're a student and you would like a book, just see Kim. She has them there on the back table. So at this point, I would like to invite Deborah Marchand to the podium, and she's going to say a few words about Phyllis Marchand and this series. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, I'm Deborah Marchand. I'm one of Phyllis's and Simon's daughters. And I'm honored to introduce some of you to the Phyllis Marchand Leadership Lecture Series if you are unfamiliar with it. When I prepare, a few words to say in front of you because I need to prepare, unlike my mom who could just do it off the cuff, I always come back to the fact that we are here in the library. Choosing the Princeton Public Library as the place to build programming to inspire women in leadership was no accident. Phyllis was a reader. In an overstuffed file of facts, and there might be some of you who don't even know what a file of facts is, <laughs> she kept an ever-growing list of books she had read and recommendations that she had been given. She religiously read the New York Times, the Trenton Times, the Princeton Packet, the Town Topics, the Princeton Planet, the Daily Princetonian, or whatever the publication in the place where she happened to be. Margaret Fuller, often referred to as the first feminist, said, today a reader, tomorrow a leader, and my mom embodied that. While I'm not sure if Phyllis would say, I'm a feminist, she would have certainly embraced and advocated the core values of feminism. She adamantly believed in women supporting women and supporting families. In tonight's discussion, Carol Limo, the author of Over the Influence, her first of hopefully many books, uh, will speak with Dr. Jane Greenway Carr, Senior Editor for Ideas and Planning at CNN Opinion, and I urge you to go back and look at some of the things that she has written, it's really inspiring. Um, about the impact of social media on girls and women. As we move into an increasingly congested world of digital and social media, it's more important than ever for each of us, our daughters, and other women and girls in our lives to learn how to safely navigate, protect ourselves and each other in what can be a both predatory and destructive, as well as an empowering and educational space. Finally, as a recovering library board president, I recognize, as did my mom, how libraries are the glue of the communities. They bring together diverse populations to share knowledge, inspire ideas, and educate anyone who wants to take advantage of its services. While they continue to face challenges far beyond building collections, they constantly morph, adapt, and find new ways to service and we have a responsibility to endorse them, and by association, our local independent bookstores like Labyrinth. It's a symbiotic relationship that cultivates community and encourages events like this. I urge you to support them whenever you can. And with that, I welcome Dr. Uh, Carr and Ms. Lano. Thank you so much. I want to thank the library and thank I want to thank the, uh, Phyllis's family for those kind words. 
and I couldn't agree more with the importance of many of the factors that you just described. Uh, so thank you again. And it's just such a wonderful pleasure to be here with Kara. Uh, I wanted to start, and forgive me for the notes, we're at a library event, so I figure notes are appropriate. Um, but I thought I would open just by, in addition to acknowledging that I get to be Kara's editor, which is a wonderful pleasure, uh, that we know each other not only in that capacity, but also as mothers raising daughters, which I think is so important to this conversation. We have scholarly and professional backgrounds in common in that they focus on gender and feminism, and we both have very digital oriented jobs that require us to be social media users as well as observers. So that informs a lot of why we're here today uh, with this book and also why I'm so honored and excited to be part of this event. It's also why perhaps a little selfishly my first question to you is about how you write that the fact that women use social media to try to build their, so their professional platforms and bolster their professional profiles in that process, they often struggle and end up with fewer followers, less engagement, reposts, and resulting opportunities <coughs> than men in their fields. And I just wanted to invite you to say a bit more about that. Why is that? And what can we do about it? Thank you. So first of all, I'm so honored to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Jane, for having this conversation. Um, and yes, yeah, so I actually didn't know this. I've been writing for CNN Opinion about these issues since 2016, and it wasn't until I started researching this book um, that I came across this research that finds that when women use social networks to try to bolster our professional profiles, we often end up with fewer followers, fewer reposts, and fewer resulting opportunities like speaking engagements um, than the men in our fields. Um, and I think this comes down to just like old fashioned implicit bias, right? When people picture an expert in their heads, they <coughs> picture a man. Um, and so people turn to men for expertise. Um, and you know, the thing about my book is that every chapter ends with a section called what we can do about it. And obviously I have loads of demands for lawmakers and tech companies, as you might imagine. Um, but this is a place where I think some collective action could very quickly change things. So one of the things I call on all of us to do in my book um, is to just be aware of this bias and try to overcorrect by following loads of women. Um, I feel so strongly about this that I've actually created a list of feminists to follow and put it on my website, which is just my name.com. Um, but of course, you know, these women are just the tip of the iceberg, but they're an incredible diverse group of women doing amazing things in lots of different fields. Um, you know, and the point is that if we all did this, we would increase women's visibility, which would, of course, help solve the problem, right? It would change perceptions of who experts are. Um, I think there's a lot that tech companies and lawmakers, or the tech companies and corporations could do as well. So if corporations recognized this as an issue, um, they could make more of an effort to repost uh, the personal posts of their women staffers at all levels. Obviously, I think they should sort of ask and make sure a woman wants this done before they you know, repost from an official corporate channel of a Fortune 500 company. Um, but that would be a great visibility boost for these women. Um, and obviously, I'd love to see tech companies recognize this and suggest that we all follow more women and amplify the posts of women experts more. Thank you for that. Um, to zoom out a little bit, um, can you say a little bit more about what motivated you to write this book in the first place? I know you just said that a lot of uh, these issues came from pieces that you wrote with me, so I did have an early inkling that you know it was coming and there was interest, but I just would like to hear more about the germination of that motivation and specifically, you know, during the writing process, some pretty significant things happened, the Dobbs decision, the COVID-19 pandemic, that really affected not only how women saw their own self-expression and their role in public discourse, but certainly the lives we were living online and offline, so. Yeah, so obviously I've been writing about these issues for a while. Um, I think what originally motivated me to write this book was trying to figure out how I would handle the social media use of my own daughters. And Jane and I went for a walk in Princeton recently and kind of had a chuckle about how naive I was to think that my biggest problem would be figuring out how to deal with my own daughter's use of social media. 
because you know, sort of the shocking realization I came to that wasn't in the original book proposal um, that I realized when I sort of sat back and digested all of these interviews I did with women and girls across the country for this book um, was that I think what's happening on social media is making the <coughs> offline world far more dangerous for women and girls. And so my biggest problem, of course, is that my daughters have to live in the world that social networks have wrought. Um, and I could give you any number of examples, um, but just one of them would be that the CDC put out its Youth Risk Behavior Survey last year, which found that between 2011 and 2021, there was a significant increase in the number of American teenagers, girls, who said that they had been forced to have sex. And one thing I know as a communication professor is that a large literature tells us that when people witness acts of violence in the media, that is correlated with committing acts of violence, right? So people who witness acts of violence in media are actually more likely to commit them. Um, and so I can't help but think that we have to trace this statistic back to all of the violence and abuse of women on social networks. And just to sort of set the stage for what I mean here, um, you know, I would say seven or eight years ago, it was the case that sure, there was lots of misogyny on social networks, but it was sort of segregated into these darker corners of the web. It was on Reddit, it was on the Manosphere, and these were communities where men with deep hatred and grievances towards women came together um, and said things that you probably couldn't say in most other places in society. Um, and as a result, you know, their views became more extreme as they got together and affirmed one another's beliefs and sort of normalized the idea of giving voice to this. But I think what's happened more recently is that that misogyny has permeated mainstream social networks. So now it is a common part of youth culture on TikTok to joke, and I'm putting that in parentheses, about violently abusing women. And that is unique compared to other forms of extremism in the sense that American teenagers are generally not on TikTok joking about, say, beheading people. Um, but somehow this has become normalized. Um, and I think it's the normalization of that that is now spreading offline. Um, and so the Dobbs decision came down after I sort of had my book contract, but it was another moment where, you know, we've had a big public conversation about everything that led up to the repeal of Roe versus Wade, and obviously there are many, many factors. Um, this was a result of an effort that was actively funded for many decades. Um, but when I sit back and think about what made um, members of the Supreme Court think that it was politically and socially feasible to take away what is sometimes a life-saving right that women had previously enjoyed in this country, I can't help but think of, again, the normalization of violence and abuse of women that is happening online. And I have to think that there's that could have played some part. Especially that point about the resources for the movement against Roe v. Wade, it takes me back to the part of the conversation you alluded to when we had our walk about not only has it helped to mainstream this kind of normalized violent behavior, but it's helped, helped build a network of these people to connect with one another that helps then reinforce that vicious cycle. Yeah, and so I think that's where we see the extremism bred on social media, right? We know that when like-minded people get together, their views become more extreme, and so social networks have just provided this space for that to happen. Just to shift gears a little bit, you have two chapters in your book about misinformation, which I think is so important and critical to talk about, and you talk about how, in particular, on social media, misinformation is targeted toward and geared toward mothers. 
which as two mothers, I think we might have a lot to say about that, but I would really like to hear more about that. Yeah, so um, one of these chapters, Misinformation for Mommies, is actually the chapter, the sample chapter that sold my book to my publisher. Um, and I think it's sort of the one kind of fake news that people rarely talk about. Um, and so I look at how a lot of misinformation about health, um, pregnancy, parenting, is targeted to mothers on social media. And the thing about being, say, a new mother is that often new mothers are physically isolated, right? You're often home recovering from childbirth. You're trying to keep your newborn away from germs in the first few weeks of life when they can be deadly. Um, and you have all these questions. You have to figure out how to keep this human alive, how to get them to sleep, how to get them to eat. Um, and one thing I recall vividly is that, you know, pretty much one of the only easy things that you can do while feeding a child for hours a day is scroll on your phone, right? Um, and so you've got women who are isolated, who have lots of questions, and who are increasingly going online. Um, and sometimes the misinformation that mothers are finding is perhaps inadvertent. So, you know, I try to be generous to women in this book um, because I think, you know, women generally have the rest of society to judge them. Um, but I would say um, I think it's important to recognize that if you're, for instance, a stay at home mom, there are very few places where you can get affirmation in our society. And so a lot of moms are creating videos, right, about what worked for their children. Um, and some of these videos are potentially really dangerous. So I'm thinking back to um, all of this content with homemade baby formula recipes um, that was shared on social networks during the recent nationwide shortage of formula. Um, and as you probably know, it's impossible to make baby formula in your kitchen. It requires a complex mix of nutrients that you can't buy at the grocery store. Um, but you know, you're seeing moms finding all of this misinformation online. Um, and sometimes, you know, the other thing about this is that I know from having a second child um, that every child is different. And so what works for one child doesn't necessarily work for another. And so when these moms post these videos about how they magically get their kid to sleep through the night, that's because that's what worked for that kid and that mom in the circumstances of their life. Um, one of the things that um, has been interesting to me on this book tour is I've had a lot of therapists in my audiences. Um, and I've also been interviewed by a lot of therapists for podcasts that they have. Um, and a lot of them are telling me, you know, their clients are watching these videos and feeling less than, right? Like, here's the video, here's, you know, it's so easy, why can't I do that? And of course, the reason is because your child and your life circumstances are different. Um, but then we also have to talk about the misinformation that is like very predatory. Um, and so part of this is that mothers are very vulnerable because we love our children so much. Um, and anyone knows that a mother will do anything to help a sick child or a child who needs help. Um, and so you have people who go after moms who uh, have children who have just received devastating medical diagnoses. Maybe it's something like a severe form of autism, and they convince these moms to buy these quack essential oils, um, you know, at vast, vast cost. And again, you know, these are women who are isolated, who are desperate to help their kids. You can understand how this happens. Um, and so I just have this radical idea in my book that if you have a medical question, you call your pediatrician or you call your doctor. Um, but I just think it's so important for us to recognize that we just should not be getting our medical information on social networks. Yeah, and you do a great job, I think, in the book of pointing out how the targeting of misinformation to mothers in particular is a pernicious kind of reinforcement of other forms of misogyny that might exist offline. So if a mother, say, which is not a crazy thing to happen, has been dismissed or not taken seriously by a medical professional and then is further vulnerable to that kind of misinformation, it tends to feed and reinforce itself. 
Yeah, and so a lot of the content that I talk about in my first chapter is content that tells women um, to deliver their children, quote unquote, naturally, um, you know, often at home, not with doctors, not in hospitals, not with epidurals. Um, you know, and I do point out that there's no movement telling men not to get pain medication when they undergo surgery or other, you know, excruciating medical procedures. Um, and so I do see a lot of misogyny there. Um, but I also talk to women who made these choices, um, which are very different from my own. And it was very interesting to me to hear from them why they made these choices. And a big part of it is because um, women feel that doctors don't listen to them often. Um, and I had that exact experience when I delivered my first child who would have been an only child if I didn't have an option to deliver in a different hospital with a different doctor the second time around. Um, and you know, I was in that instance arguably in a position of uh, extraordinary privilege because my husband was a physician who worked in the hospital where I was delivering that baby, you know, with doctors who wouldn't listen to me. Um, and so I do think um, that it is important to recognize that one part of the solution here is the medical community learning to take the complaints and preferences of women more seriously. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to pick up on something that you, in part because I think it's time for a little good news, a little hope, um, but I wanted to pick up on something that you said to start with, you know, just about how our social media worlds are shaping an offline world that is becoming increasingly less safe for women and girls. And you wrote what I think is a fantastic essay, even if I commissioned it, I'm not biased, um, for International Women's Day about this issue. And you close that piece with some real, I think, important, some, some very important insights about what we can do. Uh, and I think this would be a really great opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so a lot of the people who've been in my audiences tell me they leave my events like terrified and very worried about, you know, their daughters and themselves being on social networks and I say that's good because you should be. Um, but I also very much, you know, believe that the message I try to share in this book is one of hope which is that um, while it isn't our responsibility alone, again, I've got loads of demands for lawmakers and tech companies, there are things that we could do to make things better. So I mentioned following more women. I think we need to radically change who we follow, what we share, and what we do when we witness sexism and misogyny online. So in terms of what we share, posting about issues that affect our lives, um, amplifying the posts of people of all genders when they share this information, and then the other thing is thinking about what we do when we see women attacked or abused online. And for me personally, when I see this content, it is very tempting to clap back and to reply to those posts. Um, but I argue that it's generally not a good idea because if I give that kind of a post engagement, say by replying to it, that sends a message, of course, to social networks algorithms that people like it and want to see more of it. And so I argue that we should actually give these trolls the most devastating response possible in modern times, which is to simply ignore them. Um, but there's a few other things we can do in these situations. Um, so first, most women do not want to see their abuse given a higher profile by having other people weigh in and post about it. Um, but I'm a big fan of this practice called positive slamming. So if you see a woman attacked online, instead post something positive about her. Compliment something she's done in her career, promote her work, or something else about her. Um, and that would be a way to change this culture and of course to support that woman. Um, second, I think that we should report content that violates the community standards of social networks directly to the platform. So if you see a particular piece of content that is abusive or hateful, report it to the social network. Um, now, I will acknowledge that social networks have a reputation for either not responding to these reports when users file them, or for responding and actually writing to women no, that rape threat you received did not violate our terms of service. Um, however, I think that if we all started filing these reports in mass, it would send a very powerful message to social networks that we as users are demanding that they get this content off their platforms. 
And then the other thing is I think we need to talk to people we know when we see them posting or engaging with this kind of content. Um, I interviewed one expert who studies these kinds of posts in London and she said, at this point, pretty much all of us have a friend or know someone who's posting this kind of stuff. And I can tell you that is the case for me personally. For me too. Um, and so, um, have the offline conversation. Um, I've learned a lot from this feminist Loretta Ross who has this concept of calling people in instead of calling them out for respectful conversations. Say to someone, I wanna have a coffee with you. I wanna, I wanna talk about this. Um, and some of it is educating people and some of it is socially stigmatizing the practice. And you know, I know, like, you know, if you wanna get anyone to do anything, if you want kids to stop smoking cigarettes, you know, the most effective way to do that, of course, is to socially stigmatize it, right? Is to make their friends think that, you know, that's a gross thing to do. Um, and so that's part of what we all have to do. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about influencers. Uh, I've been working on a book about a journalist named Elizabeth Jordan who covered the Lizzie Borden trial in the 1890s and then moved on to a career where I actually think of her as a proto-influencer in part because the stories she wanted to tell about sexual harassment in the newsroom, about poverty among marginalized women, uh, about political disenfranchisement weren't necessarily possible for her to convey through journalism. She wrote a lot of fiction, she was involved in early films, she was a suffrage activist, she was a women's magazine editor, so she really sought out a number of other platforms to really get those stories out and find purview for them. And so in your chapter on influencers, I was really surprised you know, and interested to learn that you write that despite our perceptions of influencers as all being Gwyneth Paltrow or a Kardashian, most of them are women who are exploited. Uh, and I was hoping you might say more about that. Yeah, so um, the majority of teenagers today say that they want to be influencers. Um, I describe it as the new version of the American dream in my book. Um, but the reality is very different from what people think. And so most influencers are women, and most influencers earn far below the federal poverty level. Um, not the picture we have in our heads of these you know, teenagers out earning their parents, right? Um, and I believe that these are women who 20 years ago would have been freelance writers for the New York Times, for you, um, for women's magazines. Um, but part of the problem is that um, the advertising dollars that used to go to the traditional media now largely go to social networks. Um, and so you have a lot of women who struggle to balance our caregiving responsibilities with work, right? We're expected to pick up our kids at school at 3.30 in the afternoon and also be in our offices at that time. Um, and so women are trying to make some extra money with flexible schedules, so now they've decided to be influencers. Um, and I think it's easy for us as consumers of their content to feel like, you know, to complain that these women are presenting unrealistic lives, right? Their homes are always pristine, their children are always docile and smiling. Um, but I interviewed women influencers about what their lives are really like, and they talked about the pressure to project these perfect lives um, because that's the way that they can attract brands to pay them to create posts about their product. Right, so no one wants to buy products so that they can look like harried women with misbehaved kids and messy homes. Um, so these women feel this intense pressure to project perfect lives that they can't attain either. And meanwhile, they're doing the jobs of several people. So um, I argue that uh, people who work in the advertising industry, which is largely men who make way more money, do pretty much the same kind of work, right? If you're an influencer, you're coming up with story ideas, you're finding props and music rights, you're shooting and editing video, um, and now you've got one woman trying to do all this as a part-time job. It's utterly exhausting. Um, the women complain as well about the expectations that their followers have of them. So the expectation that people have of women in particular um, is that they'll overshare intimate information, pictures of their bedrooms, status updates on their romantic relationships, pictures of their children. And a lot of women are deeply uncomfortable with sharing this with the whole world but realize that their followers will feel like they don't know them if they're not sharing, oversharing all of these things. 
Um, and then followers also, you know, level this charge, I think particularly at women, that they're not authentic when they take money, right, for their posts. Even though no one complains that men who work in advertising industries promoting, in, or in the advertising industry, promoting lipstick and other cosmetics aren't authentic, right? Um, and so there's all of these pressures that these women are up against. Um, and it's just not a very glamorous, you know, job. Um, but then the therapists in my audience are telling me that all their clients are coming to them saying, I feel less than because I see on social media that all these influencers and my mom friends have these glamorous lives and I can't uh, keep up. So um, it's pretty ugly, I think, on either side. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I, I think uh, particularly the uh, posting when your house is messy is the one small way that I feel like I'm you know saying no to that at least in my own life um, but it's interesting that you say that you know going back to you know in another scenario they would be freelance writers because it's something that I hear all the time from many of the writers I work with about how many other people say well, you know, this is for you, for your exposure. You know, you, you're getting paid an exposure, and you think, well, exposure's not going to buy my groceries. So, thank you very much. Um, and I feel like that's something that came up a lot in that section of your book. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that the pay gap between men and women who influence is actually far greater than the overall pay gap in the United States, right? So, brands tell women you know, you're so lucky to represent, you know, my product and I'll send you free product and how does that pay for your childcare? Exactly, exactly. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I think we've touched on this a little bit, particularly in talking about some of the issues around misogyny, uh, but one of the things that I think you make really clear in the book is how social media can be such a toxic environment filled with hate, particularly for women and particularly for women of color. And I think a lot of people read about this, they know it's true, and they think, well, I just need to not be on there. I need to separate, I need to delete Twitter off my phone, I need to delete my apps. And that's not what you're saying and that's not what you're advocating for, which I think is really fascinating. So I, I was hoping that you might say a little bit more about why you feel so strongly that that's true and what your message is with it. Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm trying to listen to the women in my audiences as well. And one of the things I keep hearing from women at my events is, you know, I deleted Instagram a few months ago and my life has never been better. And so I just want to say, I'm not here to tell you you have to use social media, right? These are all personal decisions. Um, I always tell these women, great, and you know, maybe when you're looking for your next job, you'll be back on LinkedIn, but it's your choice. Um, but I really reject this idea that women should be run off social networks because, you know, social media companies don't want to make them safe, healthy spaces for us. Um, and this was something, I wrote an op-ed for my book as well for the LA Times, and my editor sent it back and said, you have to address this question. You say social networks are so toxic for women and girls, why should we be on them at all? Um, and my answer is two things. First, social networks are also places where we can empower ourselves. They're places where we can advocate for issues that we care about, where we can connect with other women in our field, um, where we can find jobs. And so, um, I, you know, I think it's totally unacceptable to tell women to give up a very powerful tool for empowering ourselves. Um, but then the other side of this is that that so-called solution wouldn't work at all because even if you and I deleted our social media platforms, um, these misogynists would still be on them, normalizing the idea of you know committing acts of violence against women and abusing women, and that would still be you know spilling over offline. And so, really, the only solution here, of course, is to fix what's wrong with social networks. Well, that tees up the next question that I was planning to ask, which is, well, let me step back. One of the things that I think is so great about this book that you do really well is that you outline how complex the stakeholders are in the situation. You have government, you have tech companies, you have designers, you have users, you have abusers, and I think that you know the way that they intertwine and interact is really complicated, uh, and it made me I think perhaps as a self-defense mechanism, but I think legitimately also, you know, in a, in a solutions-oriented way, I wanted to ask, so let's just imagine in a scenario that you could ask Congress, you could ask 
the heads of tech companies and you could ask social media users, particularly women and girls, to do one thing each. Obviously there are untold things that need to happen and things that need to be approved, but if you could ask them to address or take action in one way each, what would those things be? Okay, I'll try not to cheat and sneak in more than one thing. Um, oh, I totally would, so I, I understand that. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so, you know, I have been reporting on these issues for CNN Opinion since 2016. Almost nothing has been done by Congress to address these issues with social platforms. I think that we are at a pivotal, crucial moment where it is not too late for Congress to take action on AI. And that is so important because you may be familiar with deep fakes. Um, so these are fake images created by artificial intelligence. The tools to create them are widely available cheaply or for free across the internet at this stage. And surprise, surprise, the vast, the majority of images that are created um, as deep fakes are pornographic. Um, and so now we have, you know, 11 to 14 year olds at a middle school in Beverly Hills creating new deep fakes of their classmates. Um, boys did it recently in Westfield, New Jersey. Um, and the thing that I couldn't get past in the Wall Street Journal's reporting of that incident was that parents in the town of Westfield were divided over whether this was in fact a big deal or just a youthful transgression. Now, when nude images of a woman or girl end up online, it puts her at greater risk of sexual assault, it puts her at greater risk of depression, puts her at greater risk of suicide, it makes it harder for her to get a job, it makes it harder for her to date. It is life destroying, right? So there's several bills right now before Congress that would address this. The Defiance Act would be really important in allowing victims to go after perpetrators. It's really imperfect, but it's a start. But also we need AI watermarked and it needs to be a crime to remove those watermarks. So that would be my priority for lawmakers because I think we're at a moment where it's not too late to prevent pretty much um, vast harm <laughs> um, that will otherwise be inflicted on women and girls. Tech companies just have to get sexism and misogyny off their platforms. But if I could sneak just one other thing in there, I think it's so important for tech companies to just tell us with a, you know, a little icon of some sort when the things we're seeing have been manipulated. Because I think if teen girls, really women of all ages, people of all genders knew that most of the things they were seeing on Instagram do not represent people's real lives and their real bodies, it would really help prevent so much of the harm, right, from teenagers thinking they should have the Instagram body, which can usually only be achieved through surgery. Yeah. Or digital manipulation. Mm. I think, yeah, thank you for that. Um, just to shift gears a little bit to current events, uh, I know we were talking about this earlier this week, but certainly when it comes to digital manipulation of images, it's hard not to talk about Kate Middleton. Mm -hmm. And I thought about this as I was editing. I commissioned a piece about this this week from a British cultural historian who's also a woman about our age and who has kids, and we've talked a lot about these issues. And I couldn't help think about your chapters on the face and the filter and social media's role in what you call women's perpetual state of wrongness, which also feels on point for this story, um, especially when I think about Meghan Markle. I mean, her appearance at South by Southwest where she was so focused on digital bullying and all of the things that um, you know emerge from that kind of toxicity in digital culture for women. Uh, and I was wondering what you, you know, what you've been thinking as you've observed this Kate Middleton saga unfold and what kind comes to mind for you when you see these kinds of headlines? Yeah. So what I argue in two chapters of my book is that social media has the world judging women more than ever before, especially for our appearances, right? And so um, some of it is that, you know, I remember a time before social networks when you would have your photo taken when you went to a birthday party, when you went to a wedding. Um, now people are constantly confronted with images of themselves and other people on social media, and so that's what's driving a lot of the body dissatisfaction, but it's also what's inviting the whole world to judge women, right? So a picture of a woman is posted, and then everyone weighs in on whether she's authentic or whether she's fake, and weighs in on her appearance. Um, I was telling you, I think it's really interesting that we had the same reaction to this story. Yeah. One of the things that like got me to sit down and actually start writing this book 
feels minor in the scope of everything I talk about in this book, but um, because I write for you, anytime something happens in the news affecting women and girls, everyone around me sends it to me. Um, and so um, my daughter was a newborn and my husband texted me this story uh, that Jill Biden had walked onto an airplane. That was the story. And according to Glamour Magazine's website, Twitter broke. And the reason was, you know, she was wearing stockings um, and the whole world was weighing in on whether they were fishnet stockings or not. There was political fact checking sites devoted to this. Um, was she a prostitute? Was she a witch? Was she representing the country well in her unpaid, I would add, role as first lady? Um, and something in me snapped in that moment, just thinking about how social networks have provided this platform for the whole world to judge women, right? So the world has never judged women kindly going all the way back to Eve. Um, but now, you know, um, you know, 20 years ago, that would have been a snarky tabloid headline. And now everyone gets to have an opinion on her stockings. Um, and so I've written a lot about Meghan Markle and how she's been treated unfairly. But now this brings us to Kate Middleton. Here's a woman who is on medical leave. Um, but our society has decided she's not human enough to be entitled to that, right? Um, she manipulates images like everyone else, right? Um, I mean, anyone who's tried to get eight children to look in the same direction with their eyes open for a Christmas card, have, I mean, I've, have we all not manipulated? It would be a shame if it weren't, right? Yeah, I have, I'll say it. <laughs> um, and so I just, you know, it's like another example of, um, you know, how social media creates these spaces where now everyone I know is, is tweeting about Kate Middleton, right? It's not just, you know, um, nasty media commentators. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty ugly. Well, another current event that I think uh, bears discussion here, I've been thinking a lot about TikTok. Obviously, recently, the House passed a measure requiring um, TikTok's Chinese owners to divest or sell company, face a ban, um, and now, of course, it's before the Senate. And this is happening at a time, and I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier, when you know, TikTok in particular is a place where a lot of young women feel empowered to express themselves. I mean, all you have to do is look at Swifties. You know, this is a place where the voices of young women in particular are really getting amplified and find uh, a, you know, a place to connect. And so you have here a situation where Politicians are weighing in on what girls should should or shouldn't say, or where they should say it. At the same time, there are real issues that are being raised here about the safety of the platform and its algorithm, and it's happening at a time when offline, young women are also facing a lot of political disenfranchisement, a lot of issues about you know control of what they can say and do, and so it's a really complicated set of issues. So. Yeah, not to just hurl all of that at you, but I would love to hear your take on you know this move against TikTok, but also its broader context. Yeah, so um, you know people have been asking me questions on this book tour, like, all right, so what are the safe social media platforms for my kids to use? And yeah. it's like, sorry to say, I can't give you one, right? Um, I spoke about my book at the U.S. Department of Commerce last week. And um, obviously they're all wrapped up in this uh, question about TikTok, but also that's the arm of the US government that is arguably the most sympathetic to TikTok's argument that you know, they create this platform that allows so many small businesses to reach their audiences. Um, and you know, what I proposed is that what we need is nonprofit social networks, right? Um, so we need places where girls can find their voice without having their data collected and sold to foreign adversaries, or very potentially you know, access directly given TikTok's Chinese ownership. Um, you know, interest of full disclosure, I worked in the Obama administration. I was spokesperson for CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, which makes a lot of decisions about the foreign ownership of US companies. Um, and I also had, you know, the Chinese government stole my fingerprints along with other data um, when they hacked the US government in 2016. So, um, you know, that's the perspective I come from on this. Um, but having said that, um, if you didn't catch it, um, there is a huge reporting uh, in the New York Times after the Women's March about how Russian trolls 
um, came up with uh, content um, designed to basically divide American women, right? So pretending to be black feminists, feeling left out um, by the actions of white feminists, whatever it was, like, you know, actively working to divide um, American women. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the Chinese government, the Russian government, the Iranian government, other foreign adversaries, you know, ha very much have an interest in keeping our country divided because they view that as strengthening their countries in comparison, right? If you can just keep Americans involved in gender wars and race wars, that's super convenient. That's what weakens our country. And so there is, you know, what is perceived certainly by the Chinese and other, com other countries as enormous interest in doing this. And so to hand over control of the algorithm that determines what American teenagers and loads of Americans at this point um, see what news they're consuming, um, what perspectives they're exposed to. Um, I just can't imagine um, that being a smart idea under any scenario. And you know, these companies keep their algorithms so secretive that, of course, we don't have good ways of keeping track of you know, the decisions they're making, but I certainly don't trust them to make the right ones. And so I'd love to see teen girls and women of all ages finding their voice on nonprofit social networks. Thank you for that. I have a couple of other questions, but I'm sensing that people in the audience might also have questions. Uh, are we at the stage where we want to open it up? The podium's off, I think. Just to give a little bit of framing to that, you know, I think that there's a lot to say, obviously, about parenting, about online dating, just about a lot of different issues. So I would hope to uh, get some questions from the audience about some Yeah, of that. so Kim, you have the microphone. So Kim will come around. Um, put up your hand if you have a question. And OK. Kim, some right here in the front. Oh, sorry. Yep. And there's also a gentleman in the back. So um, while TikTok is probably the only major social media platform in America owned by a country that is at odds with America, there are plenty of other um, social media platforms, algorithms, as you said, actively encourage this. Do you think there's a need for legislators to um, ban these platforms, make them, I've read there was a bill that you would have to be 18 to access social media a bill of that kind, or on the other hand, a user-wide boycott or some other just form of action to make these uh, companies less profitable? Um, it's a great question. So my thinking on this is you're right. It's the algorithms, it's the algorithms, it's the algorithms. One of the stories I tell in my book is of a woman named Vivian who, by the way, wrote to me because she read one of my CNN opinion pieces, and she said to me, I got my eating disorder on Instagram. Um, and what happened is, you know, she was a teenager, she was into yoga, she posted a picture of herself doing a handstand. That picture was picked up by a Fitzbo page, Fitness Inspiration, if you're not familiar, and she was sucked down this rabbit hole. And plenty of studies by the Center for Countering Digital Hate and others find that, you know, if you want to set up an account on Instagram or TikTok and pretend to be a 13-year-old girl and search for body image content, Within minutes, you will be promoted ads for tummy tuck surgery and weight loss drinks um, and suicide content. Um, and so the algorithms do not work. Um, and um, you know, tech companies try to convince us that the way their algorithms are programmed is so incredibly complex and proprietary that we just couldn't understand. And in my book, I call this a classic form of mansplaining. Um, and my response is that I have a, something we can make super simple for them, which is that they are responsible for what their products do. So we have to fix the algorithms. The question is how. I think a lot of that comes from user demands in part. Um, I don't believe that, young, I don't believe tweens belong on social networks. I think there's probably a lot of constitutional barriers to actually making it illegal for people under age 18 to join social networks. Um, but some of the most solid research I've seen comes out of the UK. It looked at 
um, girls, for instance, between the ages of 11 and 13, and when they used social networks, that was associated with lower life satisfaction a year later. And so um, I want to acknowledge that a lot of kids are on social networks now because of the pandemic, right? And I'm not looking to make parents feel badly about their choices, especially given the context that we're emerging from. But I will say, like, I'll have parents in my audience who will say, you know, my daughter's 12. She's going to be on Instagram sooner or later. Do I really have to have this fight with her every single night at the dinner table for the next year? And my answer is, unfortunately, if you can, it, like the year does make a difference, right? Um, and so, you know, what one piece of advice I have to parents is to talk to the parents of your kids' friends. Um, while they're still young and collectively agree that your kids will hold off on getting phones and social networks until a particular age. Um, because I know that, we we're just talking about this, but you know, once my daughter's friends are on social networks, I pretty much lost that battle. I'm just gonna quickly exercise moderator's prerogative uh, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more because I know in your first chapter, Girl Meets Instagram, there's, that's where we meet Vivian. Um, I'm just gonna ask you if you wanna say a little bit more about what you do tell parents about how best to handle particularly their daughter's interactions on social media but also their sons. Yeah, so you know, one of the most important things that parents need to teach their kids is that we don't judge people for their appearances, especially ourselves, because you know this becomes so prevalent, particularly on visually oriented apps like Instagram. Um, Kate Mann um, is, in my opinion, one of the most important feminists alive, and her book Unshrinking was published in January, and she has this passage where she talks about how she'd take out Instagram, pull up pictures of people's bodies and show them to her young daughter. And they would be pictures of people of all different races and sizes and levels of ability. And what she would say to her daughter is, I'm so glad they are here in the world with us. And I thought that was one of the most beautiful ways I've ever heard of teaching your kids not to look at people and judge their bodies based on their appearances. Um, really important to talk to kids about all the threats they'll face online. So a lot of it is, you know, a big part of youth culture right now is sexting. Um, I've already explained how when these images go public, it is life destroying. So talking to kids about why they can't do that, talking to kids about why they have to say no if something makes them feel uncomfortable and consent, talking to your kids about kindness, right, from a really young age. And then, you know, perhaps the most important thing I say to parents, and I just know as a mother that it is so tempting in the heat of a moment to say, you know, to threaten to do whatever will get your kids to um, behave or, you know, do what you need them to do. Um, never tell your kids that you're going to take their phones away. Um, and so I interviewed this um, top attorney who handles cases of cyber exploitation, and she said, the most dangerous situation your kid can be in is they're being, say, sextorted, right? So some adult has convinced them to share one racy image and then told them, you know, Venmo me $25,000 in the next hour or I'm putting this image all over social media. If your kid is afraid to go to you for help, right, because they think you're gonna take their phone away, now they're being sextorted for more and more racy content to, you know, to hold this off, um, and obviously things are becoming far worse. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Cara, both for coming here, and thank you to all the organizers, especially for bearing with our patients. Um, starting young to think about these things. Um, Great, it's time. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think as someone trying to write a dissertation, I know that you know writing a book, uh, especially one that you've been thinking about for a long time, can be very tough. And having all this information here is, is amazing. I haven't read the book. I have a copy now. So maybe you go into this in the book. Um, you can tell me you know, to, to do that. Um, the question I have is one about I guess a couple of two related things. One is this question of meaning and this desperate search for meaning in a late capitalist world that seems to be pushing so many of us, but especially uh, young women and girls, to kind of go on this endless search on social media, which uh, doesn't seem to be directed towards anything in particular. Um, 
And I guess related to that question of meaning is something more, um, a kind of broader historical question. I'm thinking of the best way to pose it. So the personal is political. When, when feminism made that an agenda, it wasn't a normative statement so much as a descriptive statement. It seems that we've come over the last few decades to a point where the ways in which the, politi the, the personal lives you know, through, for example, the influencers being the most obvious example, that kind of constant, um, as it were, self-induced politicization or publicization of the personal by sharing everything that you're doing from the toothpaste that you're using. How does one kind of, you know, think about that in, in the broader struggles over what, you know, the personal and the and the and the and the public slash political mean, both as consumers and as people who are trying to find meaning. And just the last question, sorry, I'm saying a lot of things at you. The last question is this question of community and how does social isolation, the fact that I, as someone who lives at graduate housing here, does not know, despite trying, all the people who live, you know, kind of next door to me, how does that? kind of play a part in this obsession with social media that is now consuming us. Please take this as a compliment. I can see that you're writing a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> These are such great questions. Um, I can't do justice to all of them, but I want to touch on uh, sort of a few thoughts that I have as you're asking them, and thanks for bringing your daughter here too. Um, you know, when we think about community, the psychologist Marisa Franco says that America is living in a time of friendship famine. And so it used to be the case that it was more common to be connected, and now it is more common for Americans to be isolated. This is something that started with the arrival of television when people started staying home and watching sitcoms instead of going out bowling with their friends, but it's really skyrocketed with the use of phones. And I think that there can be this perception that I'm connected to 2,000 people on Facebook, and therefore I have 2,000 friends, and I've got this great community. Um, we don't need 2,000 friends. We need like one, two, or three people who we can call at the end of a really bad day, right? Um, and so I just think it's important to think about nurturing those friendships, often offline, right? If possible, you know, face-to-face -face interactions are best. But if not, you know, maybe it's using the messenger feature, right? To have more personal conversations and updates with people who we're close with. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, people going online and sharing every aspect of their lives and I think you know young people in particular but really everyone is vulnerable to this need for affirmation and attention um, and one of the things I worry about most is the fact that when girls start using social networks they quickly realize that the easiest way to rack up likes and attention is to sexualize themselves is to make themselves look hot for pictures right so now you have girls sexualizing themselves at shockingly young ages um, and so that's just one piece of this right and obviously I argue we need to change the narrative from like what toothpaste I use to like here are the issues that are affecting my life and here's what lawmakers and companies can do to fix them right um, so I know that's like just scratching the surface of some of your questions but happy to continue this conversation Yes, can you address the role of academic institutions in perpetuating uh, women's image? And if they have a role, and if they do have a role in, in this, how can it be addressed? So the role of academic institutions in perpetuating like negative body, body images of yeah, women? And women in general, that's part of it, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's every aspect of our society, right? So research does show that professors of all genders, by the way, give higher grades to women who are more attractive, right? Um, uh, it's everywhere. Um, I think, you know, obviously academic institutions have a big role to play in raising awareness of everything I'm talking about. Some of it is just sexism and misogyny. What is the definition of sexism, right? Again, I'm gonna have to quote Kate Mann here, but you know, men thinking they're better than women. What is the definition of misogyny? 
punishing women for causing displeasure to men, right? Once you know those definitions, you see it everywhere, right? So it's in education. Um, and then I would just also say, you know, I created an academic program in social media at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Part of what we look at, part of what we train students to do is manage tech companies responsible, responsibly. So we look at things like, how do you build algorithms that don't bake in bias? How do you craft community standards that do allow for freedom of expression but don't drive women off these platforms. Um, and so we have a responsibility to be looking at all of these issues. And this is one place where our educational system has just completely failed in this country. Um, no student who's ever taken one of my social media classes tells me they have ever received an education in social media before they walk in the door of my classroom as undergraduates. And that's terrifying. I guess in digital literacy of any kind, right? right? Yeah, um, you know, if my daughters were growing up in Finland, they would be learning now, you know, at the same time that they're learning how to read and write, they would be taught how content affects their emotions and how to identify altered images. And it's just, it's negligent that this education doesn't exist. And part of it, of course, would be, you know, how are women judged on their appearances on these visually oriented apps? I mean, it's all of this. I'm, you know, people keep asking me this. New York Times asked me, like, what schools are doing it right? And I'm like so fed up. I'm like determined to create a curriculum myself at this point um, because no one else is doing it. Google created a curriculum. I'm sorry, I don't think they're the best source on this. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do. Now, for nothing, Finland just voted the happiest nation on earth for something like the 12th year in a row. Okay, so. Uh, do you have a final question, Jane, and, and thoughts? Uh, I think we're getting ready to wrap it up. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I will <laughs> leave it with one final question because I think it's a question a lot of people share. One of the things that really resonated with me in your book is how practically, philosophically, intersectionally, you talk about the experience of dating online. And dating apps. It's a lot. I can't recommend it highly enough. If you've ever thought about this, if you've ever had this experience, and you say a lot about how women can be on these apps more effectively, more safely. So that's the last question. I love it. So I wrote this piece for CNN Opinion for Valentine's Day arguing that dating apps uh, are what uh, is responsible for so many Americans being single. Um, and I don't think I've ever gotten more feedback. It was based on this chapter in my book, um, including from so many people took from it that I am single. And I happened to be away for one night with my husband who's in the audience um, for Valentine's Day, the day this piece ran. And I'm also getting all of these messages from men who think I'm single, in addition to all of the people who read the book. So luckily, David has a really good sense of humor. Um, but it's a great story. But I, um, so much feedback um, on this piece. Um, so basically, the thing with dating apps is that they do not function as advertised. So dating sites tell people, if you answer this slew of very intimate questions, we will match you with someone you're compatible with or people you're compatible with. Decades of research tell us that's not possible. It is not possible to uh, predict, based on people's qualities, whether they will be compatible with one another or whether their relationship will be successful. So instead, you're answering all these intimate questions, and your data is now being sold to who knows who. Um, but beyond that, you know, all sorts of research tells us that when people perceive that they have loads of options, they value their romantic partners less, and they're more likely to break up with them. And I think that helps explain why a record number of Americans are single. So there's this perception that dating apps help you meet all these new people. And I don't want to discount the importance of that, particularly for people who are minorities in their physical communities. So it is the case that, for instance, members of the LGBTQ community are far more likely to find their partners online. Um, but basically, you know, dating apps give this impression that there's always someone more to swipe on. Um, and I think that that helps explain why the women who I interviewed for my book told me that often they stopped using these apps because they were so sick of being treated terribly by the people they matched with. Um, and it's also kind of 
why the system isn't working. So um, in 2020 and 2021, the marriage rate hit the lowest numbers since the federal government began tracking this in 1867. It's also far less likely for single Americans to be living with romantic partners now than it was a couple decades ago. Um, so dating apps are why so many people are single. Power to you if you want to be single, right? That's a, a great life choice as well. Um, but you know, I interviewed so many women looking for relationships who complained about this culture and how it has devolved, um, and why people, you know, are treating them so terribly, and also why so many of the people they're matching with don't even seem to be real. You know, it's catfishing. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, um, it is a grim scene for people using dating apps. Can I just end with some advice though? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so if you want to use a dating app to find um, a romantic partner, the thing is you have to do the filtering yourself. You have to know that apps are not going to match you with your soulmate. Even if they could, they'd have no incentive to. They lose two users, right? Um, and so you've got to aggressively filter through profiles and not be afraid to say what you're looking for, right? So there's like, you know, this culture now where women are not supposed to say, I'm looking for a relationship. Um, I interviewed one woman, a college friend, who uh, went to work for one of the world's uh, most elite consulting firms and decided she was gonna apply the same degree of savvy to mm -hmm. online dating as she did to her work. She put on her profile, if you're not interested in a relationship, please don't contact me. She went on a series of seven dates. Many of them were men she wasn't interested in, but meeting them gave her hope that there were still good people out there. The seventh was named Ryan, and she married him last summer. Um. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask for what you want, I think is the message. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, um, Kara, Jane, you have given us so much food for thought, and this is a terrific book. Um, I can't highly recommend it enough. And just, you know, the, um, this library in particular right now, we're very concerned about misinformation and disinformation. And we actually have um, a lecture series happening in our technology center that the first session had the, the packed house for it. Um, the flyer is actually right outside our door here as you're leaving. It's being taught by our head of reference department, uh, Laura Bishop, is teaching a series on, you know, protecting yourself online, misinformation and disinformation. And I agree. Um, but I actually, when I did, I called around to some of the high schools, um, you know, I wanted to encourage the students to come, and I thought that, the, I didn't realize that the schools did not have a course on social media, and I, I was surprised. Um, and it definitely is something, I think, um, that is, it is so crucial to teach our children uh, from a young age. Um, and so I thank you for all of this. And I want to thank the Marchands for continuing their support of our library with this leadership lecture. It's wonderful. We'll be back next March. Um, also, the Leadership Lecture Fund um, was able to purchase the books to give out tonight and is providing some refreshments. And I want to encourage everybody in the, effort, in the message that was given here to stay for a few minutes. Enjoy a, a lemonade and a cookie and talk to the people in this room. Talk face to face. Don't go home and start talking about this on Twitter, although that's fine too. <laughs> Stay here in this room and be in community face to face with other people. Uh, I know, as a mother of a young man, like they all, the next generation coming up, they have a big fear of phones. Like, you know, they'd rather do anything than have to answer the telephone. And that's also going, it seems to be creeping into even having to have on, like, face to face conversation. Much more comfortable texting and being online. So let's not lose this face to chance for face to face conversation. So thank you again, uh, Sai, Deborah, and the rest of the committee, um, many of who are here, Pam and Karen and Terry, who couldn't be here for helping for all the organization tonight. And uh, the book signing will be happening over here with Labyrinth. Um, so thank you.